Hi, I'm Jim Yonkins. I know most of you know me, but for those who don't, I live in Olympia, Washington. I have been an N-scale modeler since about 1990. And in 1997, I began construction of my large N-scale layout, the Mud Bay and Southern. Tonight, I'm going to give a little presentation on painting backdrops. Whenever we step outside, you'll notice that wherever you look, there is always something in the background, be it trees, hills, mountains, ocean, whatever. Imagine if you were to step outside and look at something, say a parking lot, and behind the parking lot there was nothing but a huge plywood wall. It would seem really strange. There'd be no context, there'd be little depth. So adding a scenic backdrop to our model railroads can give the scene depth as well as context. Right away you know you're in the forest or you're on the seashore. There are many types of scenic backgrounds that you might consider for your railroad. Uh, there are the commercially available photo backdrops. There are homemade photo backdrops. There are painted backdrops. You could even have an artist paint a backdrop. What I'm going to talk about in my clinic and actually demonstrate later on is painting your own backdrop. This not only will save you a great deal of money, but it's, it's actually fun once you learn a few simple techniques. I should probably give a disclaimer at this point. I am not at all trained as an artist. I am a total amateur, but I have managed to paint a about 250 linear feet of backdrops on my model railroad, just using these really simple techniques. And I think they look fine. You, you generally speaking, don't want a backdrop so detailed that it detracts from your modeling. On the other hand, you do want it to, to feel natural. And as I said earlier, give some context to your uh, scene. I have to admit that I really have only perfected one style of scenery painting. I'm modeling the area around southwest Washington, and most of it is hills and forest. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not very experienced at painting other types of scenery, but I think all the same techniques could probably apply. As I'm giving my demonstration, you'll probably notice that I'm using some very basic materials and tools. I consider myself to be very frugal, but generally speaking, I've been using inexpensive house paint to do my background painting. Having not been trained in any sort of art classes or art, I, I don't really understand all of the, the artist colors and the names of the colors. And for me, brown is brown and if you're an artist, I guess brown is umber or sienna or some such thing as that. So I find I find that the if I buy the sample size containers of house paint, you can get any number of thousands of colors. Uh, and it's easy for the paint store to match any color you should you should want to have. And generally I try to keep the colors in the same color spectrum as the scenery materials that I'm using. Uh, on my layout. So, for example, I took in this uh, to the store a sample of Woodland Scenics Green, happened to be dark green, and the guy at the paint counter was actually able to match it very nicely. With with tools, I use simple fan brushes. They're inexpensive. Uh, you find them at any craft shop that has any sort of art materials, and they're very effective. One of the questions that I'm frequently asked is, what color of blue do you use for your sky? Well, that's kind of a tough question. That's very subjective. Uh, the sky is a different color, it seems like, every time you look at it from day to day. But the color of blue I chose just happened to be uh, <laughs> a can of leftover paint from painting my kitchen. It was handy and I already had it, and it's just sort of a generic light blue color. Basically, use any color that, that you think looks appropriate. After all, this is going to be your model railroad. It's for you. So I would try to stay with lighter colors and then add more color if you needed it. Or to lighten the blue up, when you're painting, you simply just add a little white to it and that lightens it right up. So just choose sort of a medium 
a medium generic light blue color and you should be good for the sky. I'll talk about colors and te techniques more as I give my demonstration. Uh, that pretty much wraps up my introduction, I think. from I think from here we'll go on to the, the live demonstration. I wanted to mention something that I just came across actually last night. Uh, if you're an NMRA member, you probably get the NMRA turntable in your email inbox. In the October edition, there's a TSG live model railroading episode that features Rob Spangler, who gives a really awesome perspective on backdrops, creating them, painting them, uh, ideas about colors and techniques to use. So if you want more information, uh, I would suggest checking that, that out. Just go to the NMRA turntable and click on the, the live, TSG Live Model Railroading link. into the demo so you might want to um let's see here pin jim down as a speaker so you can see we're going to do just a live presentation here so let's see i'm failing to get that to work I how come Did it? Can you guys see Jim? Yeah, we got him. All right. Okay. Well, so um, <laughs> I'm not going to try to show you how to paint uh, Mount Shasta. <laughs> I'm afraid I wouldn't be very good at that. Um, so I've got a bunch of paint here and uh, my palette. Um, as I said, I'm frugal. So you don't need any fancy uh, equipment or paint. I mean, obviously, if you have artist colors and, and you know, the tubes and all that, that'd be awesome. I mean, especially if you know how to use them. Um, but um, I, I never figured that out. And, I honestly wasn't really interested. So um, one day I was thinking I should paint some backdrops for a, an Amtrak module. Um, and I went to a, a local craft stop, shop, which is actually no longer there. And told the gal at the craft shop what it was I was trying to do paint backdrops for my modules. And <clears throat> she said, oh, well, I can show you how to do trees and mountains. And so with a, oh, probably a 10 minute tutorial, off I went with some brushes and some paints, <laughs> gave it a try. And um, I actually still have some of those backdrops left and they're, they're not at all like what I paint these days. In fact, over the last 25 years of doing the backdrops on my railroad, you can tell the style has changed dramatically from, <laughs> from 25 years ago. Um, but that as long as as long as you're, you know, in the scene, consistent around in the viewing area, it doesn't seem to make much difference. It does look a little funny when you compare the upper level to the lower level and it's way different, but eh, that's the way it is. <laughs> it's just, you're focused on your trains anyway. Uh, so what I'm going to do first is paint some clouds. Um, and of course, you don't have to paint clouds, but they just seem to add a little more interest to the sky. Otherwise, it's just a big blue whatever. That doesn't happen around here very often. Uh, so I use a piece of sponge to paint the clouds with. Um, the best sponges are the ones that are just a little bit on the going bad side, just to kind of falling apart. Um, just get a little chunk of it and I make a great uh, applicator for clouds. And so what I do is I just basically, 
hope this stays still here. Okay. This kind of <laughs> well, no, it's not going to stay still. Okay. Plan B, I'll hold it. So clouds come in all shapes and sizes. So I'm just basically daubing the paint on. And then every so often, I just kind of smear it a little bit. You can make sort of wispy little clouds just by dragging the sponge across and kind of working them out a little bit, some more fluffy clouds. And so it goes pretty fast. There's really nothing very magical about it. It's just it doesn't matter where you put them, you, you can decide where you want your clouds. And and maybe you don't want to overdo it too much. But again, you can make the sky as cloudy as you want. You can add some clouds up higher. And Experiment until you get the look you want. Maybe a little, little white clouds down below it here. So anybody can do this. If, if you make a mistake, you can just wipe it off again with a sponge. Um, and and if you did this, and you got it all, you know, several feet of it. And you look at it, you go, oh, I hate that. There's a solution to that. Oops. You get out the paint roller and the blue paint, <laughs> and just go over it again. <laughs> so um, uh, it's kind of disappointing to do that, spending half an hour painting. But, but you can always fix your mistakes. Um, the other option is to get a little bit of blue paint on the sponge and kind of dab around and. Now there's kind of a spot right there with a crease in the foam core is kind of gotta hide that a little bit. Anyway, so okay, there we go. Yeah, of course. So there's clouds. Um and again, you can make them into anything you want. You could okay, so. There's the clouds. Next, we need some of my blue paint. So, typically, what I do is on my palette, I'll put a blob of blue paint. This is the same as what I painted the sky with. I think it's actually the only blue paint I've got. But anyway, um, sky blue. And then, um, so I I mentioned in my video that um, I had the paint store match some paint to Woodland Scenics Green. Well, I used all it up, unfortunately. And so now I've got some leftover house paint from when I was trying to figure out colors for my house. And I'll just kind of blend them together to get the shade of green I want. So find a clean brush. And I've got a lighter shade of green there. And then a really, really dark shade of green here. With that. Now, these two brushes someplace where I won't bump them. There we go. So, so my palette looks kind of like this. It's just a piece of cardboard with some globs of paint on it. And so I'm going to blend the two shades of green until I get the shade of green I want. And somewhere between those two. Okay, so this kind of darkest green in here that I mixed is about the same color as my trees. 
So the light color actually is pretty close to Woodland Scenic's um, blended turf. Um, and the dark, dark color is almost like the earth color. So then what I'll do is I'll take some of this green and mix it with the blue to lighten it up. Now I could have used white, except that if you use the same color as the sky and you mix it with the green, I think it gives a better result. So you just want it very, very light shade of green, green and blue. There so there's a question that just popped up about diluting with water or not? Um, actually, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I have a little tub of water over here, and uh, what will happen as I'm painting is this will start to dry out, and so if was, as the paint starts to dry it, then I'll add a little water just to, to keep this consistency. Okay, so I've got some of my brush. I'm going to hold this with one hand. So decide where you want. Now I'm going to paint a hill. Okay, so I'm going to start with the back. These will be the far away hills. Just kind of kind of bring this color down a little bit. So, um this is going to actually dry darker than it looks right now. So it takes a little bit of experimentation to figure out what, how light or dark you want your colors. Basically, I'm just going to do kind of a far, far away on the horizon. Like this, just keep working it out like that. A little more. Okay. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna paint this whole thing here all at once because it would get really boring. Um, so then what I want to do is I want to put some hills a little closer. So I get some more of my darker green paint mixed in with my blue paint make it just a bit darker. And then maybe I want to have uh, else coming down. This would be a little bit closer because they're being darker. That gives them the appearance of closer. So this is, um, this winds up being kind of like impressionist art. It's not very detailed. It's just um, very, very simplistic. But what happens is, um, as the viewer looks at this, they're looking at something that they're familiar with, at least if they live around here. There's hills all over the place. And so um, your brain kind of fills in Whatever the whatever is missing from the actual. Oh, so getting a closer range of, of hills, and and I get get a little bit more blue. Fade into this. So, kind of work the lighter color in there. Play with it until it comes out the way you want.
it's more of my property color. So the idea is to just play with colors and light and dark and uh, the idea is just to create perspective so that it looks as though the hills go on forever. Just keep blending darker colors and lighter colors and So is it pretty much a rule of thumb that the further the hills are away, the lighter they're going to be for the thing that you're painting? That's that's the way they appear. So so I'm I'm lucky. I look out my kitchen window and I look across at the Black Hills, and of course, like everything, they're, they're different every time you look at them. But but on a on a day that's the least bit hazy. Um, there's a huge difference between the hills just in West Olympia and then the hills back, say, at, uh, back on the ridge line of the hills. And there'll be several little ranges of hills in between there. And it kind of gives that effect. So as a general rule, yeah, I always make the ones in the distance seem lighter. And then you can come back and you can add some more slightly add some more detail to these hills. You don't want to make it too dark. But then if you were to come out, make it darker, it appears as though the hill is coming out from the distance. So it's not kind of a hint that So that's that's the whole process. It's just you just keep working at it until you get okay. So we've got hills far off and she put something down there. Um can't pull up. I don't know if that even shows up. Maybe um, the far away ridge. There. That. Um, I don't really like these really big, just monotonous spaces, so I usually try to work a little color into there just to, to break that up. So I would think the same basic technique could work, say if you're doing Eastern Washington and Palouse and you're doing the rolling hills, you could instead of instead of these colors, maybe you'd use uh, summertime, you know, light colors like the wheat fields are. Uh, tans and yellows and things, and uh, you could use, uh, say you're doing um, just barren hills and sagebrush, it's just a matter of colors that you use, but I think the same techniques probably all apply. Um, let's see, let's do more down here. Probably kind of overdo it. 
but if if you wind up doing something you don't really like, you can always just erase it. Um, So that would be that would be hills. Now, if you wanted to add some close-up trees, now you could do it two ways. If they're still not very close, closer, you could just kind of do the this kind of thing. It suggests that there's some trees over there. So. Kind of a stiff fan brush kind of gives you, if you pull it down or, or if you pull it up, either way works, it gives you kind of a rough, looks like forest in the distance. Uh, I noticed looking at Capitol Forest, clear up on the ridge line where they've logged, you can still see individual trees standing up. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, then if you want to be about this big, they're very, very tiny. Yeah, yeah. Um, and about the only way you can really tell is that not too long ago, that was a nice solid green, even ridge line. And now it's all raggedy and, and <laughs> it's been cut. <laughs> so they've left a few scraggly trees up. So you can paint individual trees. Fan brush works pretty good for that. So if I wanted to add a foreground tree, a fan brush just kind of. back and forth. Now it doesn't show up real good against the dark background, but I'll do one over here on the blue. It actually, it'll show up really good once it dries because it'll dry quite a bit darker than it is. And I just kind of give a reference line so I know about where I want to center the tree. And then start. And it makes kind of a nice little impressionist style tree. Um, and not very fancy, but you put a lot of this together and then you put it like behind your scenery on your layout and, and it will give you, uh, well, like, like, like I said in the, in the, in the little pres video presentation, it gives some context to the railroads so you know, well, you're in the hills and there's a forest and, um, and it looks like it goes on for some distance. So there were some areas where, um, oh, one area in particular, I made a peninsula that's three feet wide and put a backdrop down the middle of, well, not down the middle of it, but put a backdrop on it. And I wanted the major part of the scene to be as wide as I could reach. So it wound up being about 30 inches on one side of the backdrop and that left me with a one inch backdrop that left me five inches on the other side. So I have a five inch section of railroad, five inches wide. It goes for about 14 feet about. Mm -hmm. And just by by the scenery in the backdrop, you if you stand back and look at it, it doesn't look bad at all. It's very doable. So if you have a, a really limited amount of space, you can you can visually expand that a lot with the backdrop. So any, any questions? So on the trees, how do you get, I mean, I struggle with making them fit in the, in the scene, you know? I mean, how big do you make them? How do you know? Oh, okay, so that, yeah. That just comes with 
I think with practice. You might want to repeat that. I don't know if people heard. Yeah. So so if so, I am used to modeling an n scale, and my brain thinks an n scale. So when I'm painting this, I'm painting what would work really good for an n scale backdrop. <laughs> Put an H on a scale for in front of this, I think kind of funny. So, um, yeah, if I were painting this to go on to an HO scale railroad, I'd probably make everything just a little bit bigger. Maybe the hills a little higher, the uh, trees a little bigger, whatever. Um, so, you want the foreground in your painting to look an appropriate size for. What you're modeling. Um, and I've never actually never ever painted a backdrop for a larger scale. So, but I'm I'm just guessing that everything would just want to be a little bit bigger. Yeah. Especially if you were painting trees. Um, and it, so if you're painting trees, having one tree um, was kind of phony. So. I mean, you'd probably want to do more than one tree. So, so maybe you'd paint a uh, little tree down here, and a little bit overlap the bigger one. Maybe a bigger one up here. So Steve Shore says, can you move the camera or canvas closer view so we'd like to see Jim's brush movements? Oh, or turn it. Um, turn it up and do the brush. Like this? Yeah. Is that better, Steve? So you can see it? I don't know. It's kind of hard to. I was thinking just closer so we can actually see how he's twisting the brush to get the detail so actually just closer there you go <laughs> there you go yeah. okay. oh, no. so, um so i'm holding it flat and then i'm just poking the backdrop with it moving it around and that gives this representation of tree limbs. Does that help Steve a little bit? Yes. Thank so you. There's, there's a couple other questions here. Oh, yeah. Byron wants to know, did you paint the backdrop first and then foreground scenery or vice versa? Oh, okay. I, I always do things backwards. And <laughs> so, um, from experience, I can say you really don't want to put anything permanent like trees or glued down buildings in front of your backdrop before you paint it. Um, but here, so here's the conundrum. I don't really know what I want to paint until I know what's going to be in front of it. And so, for example, this afternoon, I was pulling out a whole bunch of trees that were in the way. And I'll have to go back and replant them. But having this scene finished and looking at it, kind of getting a feel for how I want it all to look. Um, do I want the hills really low? Do I want the hills higher? And so on. Um, yeah, so yeah, theoretically, if you could plan ahead enough to, to do your backdrop first, I suppose that would be good. But then you have to know what you want to do before you paint it. Um, so uh, I guess I should say that I'm not a good planner. Um, I, I actually work hours and hours and hours and hours planning my railroad before I began building it. And when it came time to actually start building the bench work, I realized that there's only so many places that I could build bench work. Because um, I had a given space, and so it's just there you are. It had to go where it had to go, and then where are you going to put the track? Uh, I had no idea where I wanted the track, but then I realized that it's pretty much got to follow the bench work. Uh, so 
all, all my planning was for naught. I must have filled two tablets of graph paper with drawings and plans and track plans and like none of it, none of it ever came to fruition. I always, I just had to start doing it and it just kind of did it. I also have to say, I never planned to have a big and scale railroad. <laughs> it just happened. It, yeah. So <laughs> because I didn't plan ahead, I had no, I had no real idea of how I was going to end it. Right? I had started it and I had an engine terminal and a yard and it went until I came to the wall and it ended at the, at the wall. It's as far as I could go, but it didn't satisfy me. It was like, no, there needs to be more because this doesn't make any sense. So then I started going the other direction from the yard. And when I got to the end of that, I still thought there should be more. It didn't, it didn't end properly. So that's been my problem all along. So my railroad has been totally finished three or four times. Um, actually, it was completely finished before COVID. And then with COVID, um, you know, to your shutdown of everything, and what are you going to do? So my COVID project was to build another level on my railroad. So now it's, now it's triple decked in some places. <laughs> but no, I'm not a good planner. And so to get back to your question about backdrop first or the, or the scenery first, I'd say so somewhere in between. There's a happy medium in there somewhere where you've got enough scenery so you know what the scenery is going to look like, but not so much that you can't paint the backdrop. So there was another comment by Paul Rising that said a peat additive called flow troll helps the peat stay brushable. Oh, I'm familiar with that. Water does too. <laughs> and it comes out of the tap. <laughs> so you just, when it starts drying out, you just mix in a little bit more water or something. Well, yeah, you know, all I have to do is just lightly dip that in the water, mix it around a little bit, and then it's <laughs> completely impressionable again. I don't know how many times you can do that, but. Uh, usually I wind up with a big glob of paint like that on my palette, I guess you call that, on my palette, and never do use it all up. But yeah, you know, there's, there are actually a lot of really neat products that I've just never ever explored. Um, what, I, what I'm doing is actually seems to be working for me. So um and i'm not I'm not really interested in being an artist um i'm more interested in trains uh, well you kind of mentioned in your video about there's two different points of view one being this is just kind of background and then other people get very elaborate yeah with an artist painting or a yeah. photo backdrop which is very very nice but sometimes can almost distract from the work you're trying to do on your layout. I don't know if you want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, the, the very best use of a photo backdrop I've ever seen is at Tyler Whitcomb's house on his um, Tanino Western Railroad. He has all of his backdrops were custom made uh, and did beautiful, very detailed. It's kind of the same sort of thing it's still it's his modeling the same area i model and and still forests and hills and he's got some really pretty rivers and things that come in the backdrop and it's beautiful beautiful stuff and he's done a totally amazing job of blending his scenery in with it um but then he has a background with art so he's good at that um, and, you know, for, for what I've done, I'd have to mortgage my house to buy backdrops for all that. <laughs> so, um, did I mention I'm frugal? 
Well, <laughs> well that, that's another interesting thing is the blending of the foreground and the background. And I don't know, I mean, I know some people are really obsessed about that, mm -hmm. trying to get those colors to match. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that's that's really important is matching matching the scenery colors with the colors you're painting with. Um, which is why I took my swatch of, actually what I did was I took a piece of cardboard, put a bunch of glue on it, spread glue, brush glue around on it, and covered it real thick with Woodland Scenics ground foam. And took it into the paint store, and they mixed me up a can of that color green. And until I ran out, that was perfect. Um, so using, you don't have to use the same colors, but you have to use kind of the same color palette, the same hues and so on. You, and you want to subdue colors. You don't, want, you don't want bright, shiny colors. You want colors that are fairly subdued. Um, anything that's shiny and bright is going to draw your eye to it. And you, that is the purpose of having the scheme backdrop. The backdrop is simply to, to just add some depth to the, your scenes and and maybe some context. Um, so yeah, choosing colors is is trial and error. I'd say you know if if you're going to use um, uh, scenic express materials, it's going to be different shades of greens. Um, woodland scenics tends to be yellow, yellowish green a lot. Whereas, whereas um, Scenic Express is truer color, I think. Um, so, yeah, you, know, you want to match what you're painting with what your scenery is. So, uh, my, my backdrops only work forest. <laughs> Although I had, I did paint in one scene a clear cut, and I wasn't really happy with it, but you know, it's, it's not too bad, you know, it's acceptable. Um, but you could use different colors of paint for, say, say if you wanted to paint a cut going through something where a road was, and you wanted to show a cut in the road down the bare earth or gravel, rock, whatever it was, then I would I would get this, mix up some paint um, that would match whatever the dirt color on my layout was, just so that it blends in. Uh, if you um, if you look at that video that I mentioned. Um, Rob goes through a lot of stuff about blending the scenery in with the backdrop. One of his tricks is to use where the, the boundary between scenery and backdrop is, he'll put a bead of paintable caulking along there and smooth it out so mm -hmm. that you don't have that sharp edge. You have a, a rounded, smoother transition. Uh, there's just all sorts of ways to do that. You could, for example, if you were, oh, he said he was doing a roadway and he was using tile grout for the road and he extended the tile grout up just a tiny bit onto the backdrop and then used the same color paint to extend it around out of sight. Um, so there's lots of little tricks like that that I never even thought of, but, um, Generally, what I do is just I keep the scenery materials thick enough at the boundary that it kind of disguises, in a lot of places, uh, disguises the actual boundary of the backdrop. So this, uh, Sid says, for matching a color, try the app color grab. It will give a code for the color and even a code for the color for a particular feed supplier. Uh -huh. Use the phone camera to take a picture of the example color. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that sounds so easy. But the guy at the paint store still got to mix it. And he has a scanner right there in the store. So that, yeah, that's, that's really good. If you went to a, if you were going to a, a paint counter where they didn't have a scanner or the guy using it didn't know what he was doing, <laughs> whatever, that would be handy to have. Where, where did you go to get your paint? Home Depot. Oh. Yeah, nothing special. <laughs> so is there other questions or comments that folks have? 
And at this point, you could unmute your mic if you want to ask it directly. You don't have to do it through the um, chat if you'd like to, to ask. I have a question. Go, Steve. Jim, we're looking at your video. It looked like you misted you misted with white spray paint between your layers, but now I see that actually the effect you get is because you start with the darker colors in uh, the lighter colors in the back and you move forward with darker colors and that almost looks like it's misty in the back. Whereas I did the opposite, I started with darker colors in the back, but oh. then I had to use uh, white spray paint to give myself a little bit of mist and then paint the next layer forward in a in a lighter, more vibrant green. But you get the same effect. So yeah, yeah. 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 And then another uh, scanning technique that I used was regarding my skirt around my bench work. I took three of my ground foam colors to the fabric store and talked to the woman there and said, "Give me a fabric." that blends with these colors the best. And so now my my skirt, I think, blends really well down. Even though you're not looking at it, it doesn't grab your eye because it blends with most of the scenery. If I was doing a desert, I would do the same thing. I would take the ground foam materials and get fabric then um, that, uh, that matched. And then as far as painting the fascia, it's real easy then take in your fabric skirt, have it scanned, and then they will match the fascia to the actual fabric. Mm -hmm. So you can scan for the background, you can scan for the fascia, and you can scan for the skirt um, so that everything, so it doesn't grab your eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's really a good technique. Anyone else? Going once. <laughs> Your clouds look fantastic on my they iPad. Great. <laughs> Thank you. They look really good in person here too. It's like amazing. <laughs> so stippling. Yeah. I, that's is that kind of what you're doing? Kinda. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think the trick is to have the right kind of sponge. Where did I put my sponge? Is there some place? There it is. So, and use flat paint, flat paint, not semi-gloss or anything, flat paint. Oh, well, yeah, no. <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah, just a little bit of white, white paint on it. That's not too much. A little bit goes a long way. And then and that's exactly what I did. So I just, yeah, kind of like that. I almost cried the other day because I couldn't find my sponge that I've had for almost 20 years. <laughs> so I had to make a new one. <laughs> this hasn't got very many miles on it. <laughs> yeah, Jim. Yeah. This is this is Paul. Um, when uh, what is your technique for dealing with the uh, deciduous trees rather than the conifers? Oh, I totally avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, then I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tie into that and say that I suggest that uh, for deciduous uh, trees that you might consider uh, uh, small pieces of natural sponge uh, because uh, those make a nice texture for uh, for the yeah. for the leaves and of course. Deciduous trees, depending on what time of the year you're talking about, but they tend to be a little bit more yellowish rather than olive-ish, if yeah. that's even a word. <laughs> I'm going to try an experiment. <laughs> so if I were to just take my sponge, kind of dab it like that. It's kind of like maybe like a weeping willow. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean they're they're obviously a different shape than the, than the conifer, but uh, they they also want to be a little bit more transparent. So what technique that I've used is to use uh, something like a uh, Prismacolor colored pencil for drawing the the trunk and major branches, and then dab over the top of it with a sponge with a, a more of a yellowish green, uh, just lightly on there. Yeah, there you go. Uh, sure, and then if well, I guess you could use a little bit of darker green to give maybe some accents somewhere. Yeah, this is this good. So I, I actually did make a few deciduous trees down on the very lowest level of my layout where nobody can see them. Um, and I used a brown colored pencil, I think it was, to draw in a branch structure. And then I used a brush like this and kind of the same, dabbing it on like that. Sponge works great though. I'll have to remember that. And if you do it fall, you got to have them yellow and brown. <laughs> yeah, what is that? Umber, right? <laughs> Something. <laughs> I have a question for Jim. A lot of times, yeah. Jim, in, in low lying clouds, you, the bottom of the clouds are darker. Have you tried putting darker so that it's like a shadow at the bottom of the cloud? You know, so I used to do that. A uh, long, long, long time ago. And my clouds always wound up looking angry. And and I think maybe I made them too dark. But yeah, you know, I think maybe just a just a touch of a really light gray color, maybe and, and just kind of do the bottoms of them, but I don't know. You know, if you look at the sky, sometimes they don't really have dark bottoms. Right, they're not all of them are that way. You're right. Yeah, um, but you know, I, I kind of tried that a long time ago, and I wasn't really happy with it. I have happy clouds. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's good. <laughs> no, I, but I I have seen that technique used, and it's very effective when it's done well. Well, in our club layout, we did photo backdrops, so the photos are a little easier to put them in because you're just taking a photo of a cloud in the sky, which already has the dark bottom to it. So Right, yeah, yeah. So, Byron, did you did somebody take the pictures, or were they per were they professionally done? No, we, did, we took the pictures. We didn't have any professionally done. We did our own photos and, and, and created our own images ourselves. And, and did you... Um, who, where did you get them printed? Costco. And how big are they? Two feet by six feet. And how did you mount them? Um, wallpaper paste. Wow. Okay. Unfortunately, Costco doesn't print those size as posters anymore. So if you, you create your own, you have to find another source for printing. I haven't, we, we got lucky the last one we needed printed, we printed the week that Costco stopped printing anymore, so. Somebody told me Kinko's will do it as, uh, as long as the roll of paper is. Oh, ah, okay, well, that's good. I don't know if that's true. But. Yeah, the good thing with Costco, they were only $30 for the two by six foot panel, so it was fairly cheap. <clears throat> From the and prices that, I've seen, that size would cost you about 60 someplace else. And, and were they photos you took around the Seattle area? Uh, well, it, yes. Most of them were the base base scenery was uh, in the mountains uh, or down in the Kent Valley. Uh, then also we would get non-copyrighted, in quotation marks, non-copyrighted images off the website, off the website, and then put them in as buildings or farm areas, machinery, stuff like that. Some of those photos were 20 and 30 layers deep uh, in Photoshop elements. Oh, wow. I know that uh, some folks, have, there's been articles about how they um, take modern photos and then they have to Photoshop out the modern cars if they're doing an older era or, um, or 
dress, uh, you know, people's attire. <laughs> that seems like a lot of work to me. Yeah. Well, we, we had the same thing. We had cars with the 1970 Ford F-150 in it. So we had to go in and put a 1950s F-100 in its place because we're modeling the, the 1950s. So, yes, you have to go do work. It's not just, you know, take them to Costco and print them. You got to create them first. Yeah, you don't want a Starbucks in the background or something that's like. Yeah, that's right. Or Civil War cannons, which happened once to us. But so, yeah, not to take away from what Jim's doing. He, this is, I really am impressed with what he's done here. And it, um, I, I'm not sure I could create it, but it gives me, it gives me ideas to use on our layout. Very good, Jim. Thank you. So Sid has another comment here. It says, for deciduous trees, I use colored Sharpie pens and do a zillion taps like a tattoo or a vaccination. This gives definition for the leaves where necessary. It would. Wow. But that's labor intensive. It's also permanent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sharpie. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, blending that one. <laughs> so, so I don't know if I, if I mentioned this. I'm also, besides frugal, uh, and very impatient. I'm not sure I can spend that much time on it. I don't spend that much time making a model tree. <laughs> yeah, well, what you do, it looks great. That's very, very good. Hopefully you guys can kind of see that online. I think it's coming through okay. Um, yeah, bring, you want to put it up closer. Yeah, bring to it closer to the camera. Uh, raise uh, it up, uh, raise right. it up. Right, right there, that's a lot better. So you can kind of see some of the textures and the clouds that he's done with the stippling. And these trees are just excellent down here. They just look great. And you can kind of see the tree lines on the top of the ridges are suggesting tree lines, so. That looks fantastic, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any other um, questions or comments? Somebody commented about what do you do first, the background, 3D, you know, your modeling or the walls. And I've always made sure that I know where my buildings are going to go. I don't glue them in place. Nothing's permanent, but I can move buildings around, uh, even have little trees kind of plugged into a piece of, of styrofoam so I can move them around to kind of see how everything's going to go together. But, and then once you know where your buildings are going, you remove the buildings because they're just sitting there and then you paint your backdrop and you put your buildings back in place. So it's kind of a give and take back and forth, simultaneous, kind of like writing a song where you're dealing with the lyric and the, uh, the, the music at the same time, back and forth, back and forth. But, but nothing's permanent, nothing's permanent until you really know exactly what you wanna do. That's good. Well, I, admittedly, the last, last, um, well, the upper level I'm building now, I, nothing really is glued down to that. So the only only thing in my way that I was painting today were trees. And I hadn't glued those in either. So I just pulled them out and painted behind them. The trouble is I couldn't find the holes I came out of. So <laughs> <laughs> I had to start over again and replant them. But no, that's easily done. So. Uh, Jim, this is Paul again. Uh, one uh, thing that uh, you reminded me in your discussion is that sometimes the shadows that the 3D trees make on your backdrop can be problematic. And uh, so what I have found is that you, you paint a similar size tree right behind it, wherever the shadow is going to land. And then that disguises uh, where that shadow is. Yeah, how about that? I never thought of that. That's a good idea. So do you use the shadow to draw the tree with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good idea though, because it, it does a, the layout lighting does cast shadows on the backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> good point. Thanks, Paul. Anyone else? All right, well, let's give a round of applause to Jim here. All six of us. Thank you. Thank you.